Prehistory is a time before written records. It is a period of human history we know the least about, but it is also the longest one. The earliest known humans arrived in these lands around 250,000 years ago. Prehistory stretches from then until the Roman invasion in AD 43. In the hundreds of thousands of years before history began, these lands underwent huge climatic, social, political, technological and geological changes. Along with artifacts discovered by archaeologists and burial sites still visible in the landscape, they can give us with fascinating glimpses into the lives of the people of prehistoric England. Lecture 4 will be about Britain's prehistory. To deal with the massive spans of time in this period, prehistory is traditionally divided into three main periods, the Stone, the Bronze and Iron Ages, named after the main technologies used at the time. Lecture plan consists of several interesting points in the history of England, such as early man, Celtic tribes and some of the invaders like Romans, Anglo-Saxons, Vikings and the Normans. As you can see from the timeline, there were several invaders in the history of the United Kingdom. Various states that are the part of the United Kingdom have been invaded several times, including by the Romans, by the Germanic people, by the Vikings and also by the Normans. Britain hasn't always been an island. It became an island after the end of the last ice age. The temperature rose and the ice cap melted, flooding the lower-lying land that is now under the North Sea and the English Channel. The ice age wasn't just one long, equally cold period. There were warmer times when the ice cap retreated and the colder periods when the ice cap reached as far as the river Thames. Around 10,000 BC, as the Ice Age drew to a close, Britain was peopled by small groups of hunters and fishers. By about 5,000 BC, Britain had finally become an island and had also become heavily forested. About 3,000 BC, that is New Stone Age, people crossed the narrow sea from Europe in small round boats Covered with animal skins, each could carry one or two persons. These people kept animals and grew corn crops and knew how to make pottery. They probably came from either the Iberian Peninsula, that is Spanish, or even the North African coast. They were small, dark and long-headed people. And maybe the forefathers of dark-haired inhabitants of Wales and Cornwall today. They settled in the western parts of Britain and Ireland, from Cornwall at the southwest end of Britain all the way to the north. So those people were called Tiberians. After 3000 BC, the Chocolate people started building great circles of earth and ditches. Inside, they built wooden buildings and the stone circles. And they called those circles the Hanges. The Hanges were centers of religious, political and economic power. But the most spectacular were Stonehenge, which was built in separate stage over a period more than a thousand years. The precise purposes of Stonehenge remain a mystery, but during the second phase of building, after about 2040 BC, huge blue stones were brought to the site from South Wales. This could only have been achieved because the political authority of the area surrounding Stonehenge was recognized over a very large area, indeed pr probably over the whole of the British Isles. Stonehenge was almost certainly a sort of capital to which the chiefs of other groups came from all over Britain. Certainly, 
earth or stone hinges were built in many parts of Britain, as far as the Orkney Islands north of Scotland. After 2400 BC, new groups of people arrived in southeast Britain from Europe. They were round-headed and strongly built. Their influence was soon felt and as a result they became leaders of British society. Their arrival is marked by the first individual graves furnished with pottery beakers from which these people got their name, the Bika people. The Bika people probably spoke an Indo-European language. They seem to have brought a single culture to the whole of Britain. They also brought skills to make bronze tools and these began to replace stone ones. But they accepted many of the old ways and Stonehenge remained the most important center of the people living on the British Isles. Around 700 BC, another group of people began to arrive. Many of them were tall and had fair or red hair and blue eyes. These were the Celts, who probably came from Central Europe or further east, from southern Russia and had moved slowly westwards in earlier centuries. The Celts were technically advanced. They knew how to work with iron and could make better weapons than the people who used bronze. It's possible that they drove many of the old inhabitants westwards into Wales, Scotland and Ireland. The Celts began to control all the lowlands areas of Britain and were joined by new arrivals from the European mainland. They continued to arrive in one wave after another over the next 700 years. The Celtic tribes were ruled over by a warrior class, of which the priests or druids seem to have been particularly important members. These druids couldn't read or write, but they memorized all the religious teachings, the tribal lore's history, medicine, and other knowledge necessary in Celtic society. The Druids from different tribes all over Britain probably met once a year. They hadn't any churches or temples, but they met in sacred groves of trees on certain hills, by rivers or by river sources. We know little of their kind of worship except that at times it included human sacrifice. The Celts are important in British history because they are the ancestors of many of the people in Highland Scotland, Wales, Ireland and Cornwall today. The Iberian people of Wales and Cornwall took on the new culture of Celtic people. Celtic languages, which have been continuously used in some areas since that time, are still spoken. The Celts were organized into different tribes and tribal chiefs were chosen from each family or tribe, sometimes as a result of fighting matches between individuals and sometimes by election. Some certain Celtic tribes were Scots, Britons and Picts. The Celtic tribes continued the same kind of agriculture as the Bronze Age people before them. But the use of iron technology and the introduction of more advanced plowing methods made it possible for them to farm heavier soils. However, they continued to use and build hill forts. The increase of these, particularly in the southeast, suggests that the Celts were highly successful farmers, growing enough food for a much larger population. During the Celtic period, women may have had more independence than they had again for hundreds of years. When the Romans invaded Britain, two of the largest tribes were ruled by women who fought against them. The most powerful Celt to stand up to the Romans was a woman, Baudicea. She had become queen of the tribe when her husband had died. She was tall with long red hair and had a fighting appearance. In AD 61, she led her tribe against the Romans, 
She nearly drove them from Britain and she destroyed London, the Roman capital, before she was defeated and killed. Julius Caesar first came to Britain in 55 BC, but it was not until almost a century later, in AD 43, that the Roman army actually occupied Britain. The Romans were determined to conquer the whole island. They had little difficulty because they had a better trained army and because the Celtic tribes were at war with each other. The Romans established a Romano-British culture across the southern half of Britain. This part of Britain was inside the empire. Beyond were the upland areas under Roman control but not developed. These areas were watched from the towns of York and Chester and in the western peninsula of Britain that later became known as Wales. Each of these towns was held by a Roman legion of about 7,000 men. The total Roman army in Britain was about 40,000 men. The Romans couldn't conquer Caledonia, as they called Scotland. Also, they spent over a century trying to do so. At last, they built a strong wall along the northern border, named after the emperor Hadrian, who planned it. At the time, Hadrian's wall was simply intended to keep out raiders from the north. But it is also marked the border between the two later countries, England and Scotland. Roman control of Britain came to an end as the empire began to collapse. The first signs were the attacks by Celts of Caledonia in AD 367. The Roman legions found it more and more difficult to stop the raiders from crossing Hadrian's Wall. And in AD 409, Rome pulled its last soldiers out of Britain and left the country. The most obvious characteristic of Roman life in Britain was its towns, which were the basis of Roman administration. Many grew out of Celtic settlements, military camps or market centers, because before Romans' arrival, Celtic people lived in villages. The Romans left about 20 large towns of about 5,000 inhabitants and almost 100 smaller ones. Many of these towns were at first army camps and the Latin word for camp is castra has remained part of many town names to this day with the ending Chester, Castor or Cester, for example Manchester, Gloucester, Doncaster, Winchester, Chester, Lancaster and many others besides. These towns were built with stone as well as wood and had planned streets, markets and shops. Some buildings had central heating. They were connected by roads which were so well built that they survived when later roads broke up. These roads continued to be used long after the Romans left and became the main roads of modern Britain. Six of these Roman roads met in London, a capital city of about 20,000 people. London was twice the size of Paris and possibly the most important trading center of Northern Europe because Southeast Britain produced so much corn for export. Outside the towns, the biggest change during the Roman occupation was the growth of large farms and they called them villas. These belonged to the richer Britons, who were like the townspeople more Roman than Celt in their manners. Each villa had many workers. The villas were usually close to towns so that the crops could be sold easily. There was a growing difference between the rich and those who did the actual work on the land. These, the most people, still lived in the same kind of round huts and villages which the Celts had been living in 400 years earlier when the Romans arrived. In some ways, life in Roman Britain seems very civilized, but it was also hard for all except for the richest people. 
it's very difficult to be sure how many people were living in Britain when the Romans left. Probably it was as many as 5 million. Because of the peace and the increased economic life which the Romans had brought to the country. The new wave of invaders changed all that. The wealth of Britain by the 4th century, the result of its mild climate and centuries of peace, was a temptation to the greedy. At first, the Germanic tribes only raided Britain, but after AD 430, they began to settle. The newcomers were warlike and illiterate. The invaders came from three powerful Germanic tribes, the Saxons, Angles, and Jutes. The Jutes settled mainly in Kent and along the south coast and were soon considered no different from the Angles and Saxons. The Angles settled in the east and also in the north Midlands, while the Saxons settled between the Jutes and Angles in a band of land from the Thames. The Anglo-Saxons' migrations gave the large part of Britain its new name, England, the land of Angles. The British Celts fought the raiders and settlers from Germany as well as they could. However, during the next hundred years, they were slowly pushed westwards until by 570 they were forced west of Gloucester. Finally, most were driven into the mountains in the far west, which the Saxons called Wellers or Wales, meaning the land of the foreigners. Some Celts were driven into Cornwall, where they later accepted the rule of Saxon lords. In the north, other Celts were driven into the lowlands of the country which became known as Scotland. Some Celts stayed behind and many became slaves of Saxons. Hardly anything is left of Celtic language and culture in England, except for the names of some rivers like Thames, Mercy, Severn and Avon, and two large cities, London and Leeds. The strength of Anglo-Saxon culture is obvious even today. Days of the week were named after Germanic gods. Tick, Tuesday, Wooden, Wednesday, Thor, Thursday, Frey, Friday. New place names appeared on the map. The first of these show that the earlier Saxon villages, like the Celtic ones, were family villages. The ending in meant folk or family. For example, Husting means the family of Huster. Ham means farm and Tan means settlement, that is Birmingham, Nottingham or Southampton. Because the Anglo-Saxon kings often established settlements, Kingston is a frequent place name. The Anglo-Saxons established a number of kingdoms, some of which still exist in county or regional names to this day. Those kingdoms were at war with each other. By the middle of the 7th century, there were seven kingdoms which were the most powerful. They were Essex, East Saxons, Sussex, South Saxons, Wessex, West Saxons, Kent, East Anglia, meaning East Angles, Nazambria, and Mercia. The Saxons created institutions which made the English state strong for the next 500 years. One of these institutions was the King's Council, called the Witten. The Witten probably grew out of informal groups of senior warriors and churchmen to whom kings had turned for advice or support on difficult matters. By the 10th century, the Witten was a formal body, issuing laws and charters. It was not all democratic, and the king could decide to ignore the Witten's advice, but he knew that it might be dangerous to do so. For the Witten's authority was based on its right to choose kings and to agree the use of the king's laws. Without its support, the king's own authority was in danger. 
The Witten established a system which remained an important part of the king's method of government. Even today, the king or queen has a privy council, a group of advisors on the affairs of state. The Saxons divided the land into new administrative areas based on shires or counties. These shires, established by the end of the 10th century, remained almost exactly the same for a thousand years. Shire is a Saxon word and county is a Norman word, but both are still used. Over each shire was appointed a shire reeve, the king's local administrator. In time this name became shortened to sheriff. Anglo-Saxon technology changed the shape of English agriculture. The Saxons settled previously unfarmed areas. They cut down many forested areas and valleys to farm their richer lowlands, and they began to drain the wetland. As a result, almost all the villages which appeared on 18th century maps already existed by the 11th century. Towards the end of the 8th century, new raiders were attempted by Britain's Welsh. These were the Vikings, a word which probably means either pirates or the people of the sea inlets, and they came from Norway and Denmark. Like the Anglo-Saxons, they only raided at first. They burned churches and monasteries along the east, north and west coasts of Britain and Ireland. London was itself raided in 842. In 865, the Vikings invaded Britain and it was clear that the quarreling with each other and the Saxon kingdoms couldn't keep them out. This time they came to conquer and to settle. The Vikings quickly accepted Christianity and didn't disturb the local population. By 875, only King Alfred in the west of Wessex held out against the Vikings, who had already taken most of England. After some serious defeats, Alfred won a decisive battle in 878, and eight years later he captured London. He was strong enough to make a treaty with the Vikings. Viking rule was recognized in the east and north of England. It was called the Dane Law the land where the law of the Danes ruled. In the rest of the country, Alfred was recognized as king. During his struggle against the Danes, he had built walled settlements to keep them out. These were called boroughs. They became prosperous market towns, and the word now usually spelled boroughs is one of the commonest ending to place names, as well as the name of the unit of town administration today, like Newborough, Southborough, and so on. There were many famous Anglo-Saxon kings, but the most famous of all was Alfred, one of the only kings in British history to be called great. His father was king of Wessex, but by the end of Alfred's reign, his coins referred to him as king of the English. In this time, he ruled successfully over his Anglo-Saxon kingdom and emerged as a military force, a strong leader and promoter of reforms. His most important achievement was to prevent an island-wide invasion from the Danes and establish a united Anglo-Saxon culture. Alfred also took tentative steps in establishing a navy to tackle the naval capacity of the Danes on the English coastline. That means he founded the first English fleet. Alfred's reforms and ideas were applied to the education system developed during his reign. He placed much importance on translations from Latin to English in order to establish a wider area of books accessible for learning. These books covered history, geography, philosophy, and copies of these books were sent to all bishops of the kingdom. He introduced schools, a system providing a sound education not only for the nobility but also those with lesser status. He ensured the best scholars would teach in these schools with curricula dedicated to the liberal arts. Alfred's keen intellectual disposition was evident in the way he chose to reform, develop and improve Anglo-Saxon society under his reign. By 950, England seemed rich and peaceful again after the troubles of the Viking invasion. 
But soon afterwards, the Danish Vikings started raiding westwards. The Saxon king Ethelred decided to pay the Vikings to stay away. To find the money, he set a tax on all his people, called Danegeld, or Danish money. It was the beginning of a regular tax system of the people, which would provide the money for armies. The effects of these tax were mostly heavily felt by the ordinary villagers, because they had to provide enough money for their village landlord to pay Danegeld. When Ethelred died, Knut, the leader of the Danish Vikings, controlled much of England. He became king for the simple reason that the royal council, the Witten, and everyone else feared his order. Rule by a Danish king was far better than rule by no one at all. Knut died in 1035, and his son died shortly after in 1040. The Witten chose Edward, one of the Saxon Ethelred's sons, to be king. Edward, known as the Confessor, was more interested in the church than in kingship. Church building had been going on for over a century, and he encouraged it. By the time Edward died, there was a church in almost every village. The pattern of the English village with its church dates from this time. Edward started a new church at Westminster, Westminster Abbey. Westminster Abbey was a Norman, not a Saxon building, because Edward spent almost his, all his life in Normandy, and his mother was a daughter of the Duke of Normandy. As their name suggests, the Normans were people from the north. They were the children and grandchildren of Vikings who had captured and settled in northern France. They had soon become French in their language and Christian in their religion. But they were still known for their fighting skills. Edward only lived until 1066, and then he died without an obvious heir. The question of who should follow him as king was one of the most important in English history. Edward had brought many Normans to his English court from France. These Normans were not liked by the more powerful Saxon nobles, particularly by the most powerful family of Wessex, the Godwinsons. It was Harold Godwinson whom the Witten chose to be the next king of England. Harold had already shown his bravery and ability. He had no royal blood, but he seemed a good choice for the throne of England. Harold's right uh, to the English throne was challenged by Duke William of Normandy. William had two claims to English throne. His first claim was that King Edward had promised it to him. The second claim was that Harold, who had visited William in 1064, had also promised William that he wouldn't try to take the throne for himself. Harold was faced by two dangers, one in the south and one in the north. In 1066, Harold had to march north in Yorkshire to defeat the Danes. No sooner he had defeated them than he learned that William had landed in England with an army. His men were tired, but they had no time to rest. They marched south as fast as possible. Harold decided not to wait for the whole Saxon army together because William's army was small. He thought he could beat them with the men he had done so well against the Danes. However, the Norman soldiers were better armed, better organized. If he had waited, Harold might have won. But he was defeated and killed in battle near Hastings. William marched to London, which quickly gave in when he began to burn villages outside the city. He was crowned the King of England in Edward's new church of Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day, 1066. A new period had begun. Although William was now crowned king, his conquest had only just begun, and the fighting lasted for another five years. There was an Anglo-Saxon rebellion against the Normans every year until 1070. The small Norman army marched from village to village, destroying places it couldn't control, and buildings forced to guard others. It was a true army of occupation for at least 20 years. 
The North was particularly hard to control, and the Norman army had no mercy. When the Saxons fought back, the Normans burned, destroyed, and killed. Few Saxon lords kept their lands, and those who did were a very small number who had accepted Williams immediately. All the others lost everything. By 1086, 20 years after the arrival of the Normans, only two of the greater landlords and only two bishops were Saxon. William gave the Saxon land to his Norman nobles. After each English rebellion, there was more land to give away. His army included Norman and other French land seekers. Over 4,000 Saxon landlords were replaced by 200 Norman ones. From the 9th century until the 14th century, the form of French was even the official language in the courts of England. During those years, the common people spoke an old form of English, while the kings, queens, and members of the court spoke French. The early history of England includes five invasions, which contributed to the development of the country, as well as to the development of the English language as well. They are the Roman invasion, the Anglo-Saxon invasions, the Viking invasions, the Norman French invasions, and the Christian invasion. Although certainly not a military invasion like the others on the list, the arrival of Christianity in Britain was as influential on the language and the culture. The Anglo-Saxons were mostly illiterate. Therefore, their oral stories were not written until the Christian monks recorded them. About 70% of modern English vocabulary is represented by loan words, which have been borrowed from the languages of their invaders. Romans brought Latin and 29% of the words in the English language have come from a Latin origin. For example, Latin words kitchen, wall, port, or cross and dean. About 10,000 of French borrowings came into English during the Norman conquest. For example, state, army, war, battle, sentence, lunch. About 1,097 words came as a result of the Viking invasions. For example, the pronouns they, them, verbs to call, to want, to die. Adjectives like ill, happy, and nouns like cave, at knife, and window. So we can say that even today we use the traces of invaders. Here are some comprehension questions for you to answer. Look through the questions and try to give a full answer in written form. Thank you for your interest in the history of the United Kingdom, and I hope you have enjoyed the presentation.